Good morning to all our students. I welcome Professor Barbieri with great pleasure having him at MCOST here. It is not just an honor for us to have such a eminent professor with us here, but also the, the topic that he will be talking about is extremely interesting. We have some commonalities between myself and Professor Barbier because he teaches at the University of Padua and I am a graduate of the University of Padua many, many, many years ago. You weren't even born, obviously. But it was one of my nicest experiences in my life to be at that university. And having Professor Barbier here has added value to your studies. I'm so happy to see you all here, surrounding these tables, ready to hear what he has to share with us. And this is, this is what added value means to your studies. And this is how we enrich ourselves when we interact with other knowledge and with other experiences. And the experiences of Professor Barbieri are huge. And therefore, it is quite an honor and a privilege to have you here with us this morning. And I will be eagerly listening to what you have to say and what you have to share with our students. And thank you for visiting us and MCOST. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kalea. I'm uh, Dr. Leonardo Barilaro, senior lecturer in aerospace. Is, uh, as uh, the principal was saying, it's a huge honor to have here uh, Professor Emeritus Cesare Barbieri. His visit here uh, at MCAST uh, is uh, related uh, to the new aerospace program that started uh, a few months ago and also linked uh, with the start of the Master in Aerospace Engineering. Last week was uh, really amazing. We had uh, really important uh, meetings with uh, uh, the principal, uh, and uh, the top management uh, of uh, MCAST. We had the technical meetings. We met uh, the Italian ambassador. Here today we have also Dr. Sebastiano D'Amico, uh, which is the coordinator of ADORIM, the Association of Italian Research and Professor, which in Malta is a pretty big uh, organization and important. I will, uh, I don't want to speak too much, but uh, for me today is a very beautiful day because uh, Professor will uh, share with uh, all of you um, his uh, experience, the most important projects uh, to which uh, he took part in. And uh, I want uh, to say this. I was a student. He inspired me to start the PhD in aerospace engineering. And uh, this is also thanks to this that I'm uh, here today. And. Um, the most important uh, thing uh, I learned from him uh, is that uh, I believe, uh, uh, yes, we study on books, uh, we, we have to study a lot, uh, but we learn uh, from the example, and uh, uh, an example that can inspire us. And uh, still nowadays uh, is uh, a great inspiration for me, and also he gave a lot of uh, uh, interesting suggestions uh, to, to us uh, for uh, the aerospace program and uh, the new master. To organize something like this is not easy at all. There is a lot of behind the scenes work, so I would like to um, give a big shout out, a big uh, thank you to uh, who was involved. So uh, starting from uh, the support uh, from day one, uh, from uh, principal, Professor Calleia, Dr. Mario Cardona, uh, Director uh, Steven uh, Samut, uh, Director uh, of Aerospace uh, uh, Roberto Tiscio, and all of the research uh, uh, team that uh, is growing a lot here uh, at MCAST. And uh, so thank you to Dr. Uh, Alex Rizzo, uh, Dr. Clifford Raffaele, Dr. Andrea Tard that uh, made uh, all of this possible. So, I hope uh, you also will feel inspired, and I leave the stage to Professor uh, Barbieri. Thank you. Uh, let me say that it's a great honor to be here. I wish to thank Professor Kaleya and all his collaborators for this opportunity I have to visit for the first time 
an institution and an island, which I didn't know before. An institution that I, st I mean, I started learning few, only a few days ago, but I can already appreciate the momentum, the push toward novel uh, lines of research, aerospace, maybe uh, I hear of a cannon, hypervelocity cannon being planned, uh, other activities which will put MCAST and I guess also the University of Malta at the very, very rich field of opportunities for scientists, for engineers, but also for sociologists. Space is really around us, so it, uh, in a way, it will uh, uh, be p more and more present in our everyday life. So it's a really a wise decision to start a line of thing of uh, educating, of researching, of experimenting in this very broad field. So my, uh, I wrote my story, but uh, is m my scientific story, which I want to share with you at the beginning, before moving into my last, uh, very large project, uh, program. You see uh, on one side of the screen, the National Telescope Galileo, which is the largest Italian telescope, which is not on Italian soil, is in the, the island of La Palma in the Canaries, the same island where the volcano today is giving so many, so many problems, uh, is the 25th anniversary of his uh, dedication, so I am supposed to go there on Sunday I hope that the volcano will not stop me. And, uh, and the second uh, frame is me standing next to the model of the comet Churium of Grasimenko we visited with the Rosetta mission from 2014 to 2016. And the last part of my talk will be about this, uh, this uh, mission Rosetta. Uh, so what I did um, in all my life was to study the sky. This beautiful sky, here you see the Milky Way raising uh, from, from the mountain in Chile, uh, is, uh, well, is really a fantastic, uh, maybe there are too many lives for you to appreciate the beauties of the, of the Milky Way here, but you can, you can see by your, with your eyes, uh, Malta is dark, um, dark spots, and uh, when it is clear, it, it will be a, a wonderful, a wonderful scene. But, uh, so this is the, the, say, the field of my interest. So I worked in astronomy mostly at night, except, except at the very beginning, because I did my thesis in Bologna in very, very many, many years ago, using the, uh, studying the sun. So that was my first time on, and last time on, on daylight, I was studying the sun with the small parabola you see next to the gigantic Northern Cross, which is near Bologna. It, it was a masterpiece of engineering and communication at the time. And the small parabola I used to study the sun now is used to search for extraterrestrial intelligence. This uh, uh, parabola has been equipped with, with very, very sophisticated receivers. They scan the sky on a certain number of frequencies with the hope to detect intelligent signals. They have not been, uh, been uh, uh, found yet, but the search is going on. I mean, finding an alien civilization, that would be a big, big step forward. Uh, when I was a, a student in Bologna, I met a very old man who in, had invented in, uh, before the war, around 1938, had invented uh, 
how to make large telescopes using smaller telescopes. Uh, you see, synthesizing a large aperture with a, uh, with a hexagonal small pieces. Nobody trusted him, but he went on and on, uh, and finally his, uh, his uh, uh, technique nowadays is used in all largest telescopes in the world. So uh, there, is a, there is a lesson to be learned here. Uh, he, he was a Jewish, and so the infamous laws we had in Italy in 1938 deprived him from the chair. And he was taken out of job and out of research. And when we, he came back after the war, he was already very old. But I was so, so fortunate to spend my thesis time with him in his room. So I learned a lot about how to make new telescopes. That was really a fortune for me to meet this, this man. And then uh, after my thesis, I immediately moved to Padua, which you know is famous for the researches, the discoveries made there by Galileo Galilei in uh, 1609, 1610, when he really opened the sky. This, this tower, though, is later, was founded by the Republic of Venice. It was the last the act, formal act of the Republic, the institution of the specula, and then Napoleon came, like in Malta. <laughs> and, and, but uh, this uh, specula is, is still active today, is a beautiful place, and of course, should you, should you like to pay a visit to, to Padova, even with your students, that would be a great, a great uh, visit for history and for science. Uh, then our university built in 1942, right at the beginning of the Second World War, this famous telescope in Asiago, dedicated to Galileo Galilei, is a beautiful telescope done so many years ago. So I was very lucky to get a position in Padua. I never, uh, I will always, I would always spend my uh, career there with important parentheses abroad. For instance, I moved to Texas as a postdoc fellow in 1968-69. And uh, that was also very important because uh, University of Texas was building for NASA uh, a beautiful telescope dedicated only to planets. And uh, so, uh, I learned how to make a telescope there. I learned what NASA is, because I, uh, uh, the NASA personnel was there all the time. I learned how important space would become for a solar system that maybe you are too young to, uh, to know that at that time, 1970 or so, we knew very, very little about the solar system. Before the space age, we didn't really understand. And now the new concept developed that the Earth is a planet. Yeah, in the past, it was like two separate fields, Earth and planets. But now you cannot study planets if you don't study the Earth and vice versa. And this was a, a product of um, in enterprises like the NASA telescopes in preparation for the exploration of the solar system by space. Back in Padua, my first duty was to build a 1.8 meter telescope, still the largest in, in the Italian soil. Uh, the uh, telescope is, is a beautiful one, uh, although it's a bit old, but we kept it to very modern standards, is uh, really equipped with the best detectors. Uh, as you know, today we have solid state detectors, the charge couple devices, or the CMOS, or whatever. 
of, uh, of the infrared solid detectors. So we, uh, at the time it was photography because there was nothing else, but today we have all sorts of uh, digital uh, equipment. And, uh, and then uh, when I became the director there, I decided to put next to the, the 1.8 Copernicus telescope another excellent uh, telescope which was in a, not in a so uh, fine position. So now today we have two telescopes, very, very good, with the, what is called Schmidt telescope. We took, we take the best uh, images of the sky. So uh, the Copernicus is a multipurpose, the Schmidt is essentially for photography. So we have a very complete astronomical observatory in Asiago. Again, if any student is interested in astronomy, we would be very happy to support his coming. And we do every year uh, a summer school and a winter school. So if you are, some of your students are interested, I'd be very happy to help him to come to Asiago, spend their, maybe winter is not good for them, but summer, yes. Uh, and finally, I, I was involved because I, had, I, had, I was one of the few Italians who really knew how to make telescopes and instrumentation. I, I was involved in the European team for the instrumentation of the Hubble Space Telescope. As you know, the Hubble Space Telescope is a fantastic machine. It's up there around 600 kilometers uh, uh, above our heads. Uh, it was taken there by the shuttle because the shuttle was still flying at the time. It was repaired by the astronauts of the shuttle when there were two important uh, problems. So there were two um, extra missions to the space telescope. But finally, it's a fantastic instrument which is uh, nearing his life because gyroscopes are dead. Uh, but they still manage to go without gyroscopes. It takes beautiful images from the ultraviolet to the near infrared. Maybe his successors will be launched soon, but at the moment, uh, we hope that, uh, that the HST doesn't die because it's really uh, the only asset we have on sky. Uh, okay, then first, First comet, first of the two my comets, the uh, European Space Mi uh, Agency launched a mission named Giotto to Comet Alley. I will come back to this part of my talk uh, about Giotto. I just want to point out how politically important it was such mission. Remember, 1986, no uh, communication between the Soviet bloc and the, and the Western bloc, no internet, no red line, no nothing. But still, around the comet alley, we had six space missions, two from Soviet Union, two from Japan, one from uh, ESA, from Europe, JOTO, and one from the Americans. So it was a very uh, difficult, politically difficult coordination of uh, scientists and nations. And at the end of it, they all came to Padua. Uh, you can see me here, perhaps, <laughs> younger me. Uh, but it was so important to have in the same room all agencies, the Soviets, the Americans, the Japanese, the Europeans, all talking friendly and exchanging information. And, and then even more political. So Padua has always been a politically important uh, city, as, as, you, as you, Professor Calaya, know very well. But then we could take all of them and take them to a very spe I mean, spectacular audience with Pope Paul John II, 
uh, even the Soviets, even I mean, we, we were all there together uh, in the name of this uh, comet, uh, un united many faiths, many sciences, many humanities. And so this was my first encounter with the Pope, mm -hmm. with the great Pope. Then I started building the Telescopio Nazionale Galileo in the island of La Palma, here, the, and uh, up there, there is a heaven for telescopes. There are many telescopes from uh, Spain, from UK. This side of the mountain is the English side. There is uh, in the middle the northern countries, Sweden, uh, Norway, and so on. And the, this side, the western side, is the Latin side, Spanish and Italians. So you see, it's a beauti beautiful place. It's, uh, it's on the rim of a volcano, of a caldera of a volcano, 2,400 meters elevation. A beautiful place, but in these days there is a, a volcano uh, south of it, which is, uh, is giving some problems, especially for the for the ashes, it's calm, so we have to keep all the domes closed in order not to, spo not to uh, uh, spoil the mirrors. But during the construction, two, two comets came. You see the TNG still very in a primitive form. We were erecting the structure, and comet Yakutaki came, and, and after a while, comet Bob, the dome was almost finished, but not operating. But for me, it was like Comet telling, well, you have to come back. Uh, after Giotto, you did a telescope. Why don't you come back to Comets? So that was a message. <laughs> and uh, this is the telescope when it was finished. A very, very, very nice uh, structure. And today, again, the TNG is one of the best telescopes around to look for extraterrestrial planets. Uh, we do with very special techniques, and the, uh, so uh, again, this matter, the subject of extraterrestrial civilizations and extraterrestrial planets, it was at the start of my career, but also uh, continuing till now. As, uh, at the end of this, when we dedicated the telescope, NASA had finished the Galileo mission, and uh, it was time to recall of Galileo the man, so we made another gigantic conference uh, which uh, on the three Galileos, which again was hosted by the Holy Father uh, in January uh, 1997. Always in the name of Galileo, I hosted two other in very important conferences. One is for, sorry, uh, for the Galileo Global Navigation System of the co European Community and ESA. It's like the, it's like the uh, European GPS system. You might have heard of it, you can use it. We, we had a very important conference with many sponsors and with a concert, and you can recognize who did the, the official concert at the time, our Dr. Baridaro, who, who performed extremely well at the official closing of the, of the uh, meeting. And then the other conference was uh, sponsored by the International Astronomical Union in the anniversary, 400th anniversary of the discoveries of the Medician Moon by Galileo Galilei in Padua. So, so again, you have to do the best of the history of your, of your university. And, um, and of course, Padua is very rich. Now is 800 years old, so we have many, many events to celebrate, but for astronomy, those were very important. And, and those, this is not astronomy, this is telecommunication. Uh, 
Then I, there is something different. I, I call it uh, back to the future uh, because I was going back to physics in a way, but with an eye to the future. Back to the physics because I started my, uh, as a physicist, but uh, we wanted to do something strange. The European Southern Observatory had in mind to build a telescope of 100 meter aperture, a gigantic telescope. The project never uh, took off, it was too costly, too difficult, now is reduced to 39 meter, uh, which is still the largest telescope in the world, is being built on the, in Chile, on the northern part of Chile, is a beautiful engineering, optical and astronomical enterprise. And uh, what we did was simply to uh, be curious, if you have such a large telescope which is concentrating his photons in the focal plane. What is the density of photon there? Well, it's not too different from what you get from a laser beam. And when you have a laser beam, you don't do classical optics, you do quantum optics. So we, we said, can, can we perhaps use the light from celestial uh, uh, sources, not in the classical way, when you do intensity, you do spectroscopy, you do polarization. But you can do statistics of the arrival time of photons. And, and this is what distinguishes thermal from non-thermal emission, Cherenkov emission from synchrotron radiation, and so on, LED from an incandescent lamp. So is the st statistics of photon arrival times, which we were uh, start to study in celestial sources. Uh, mm -hmm. So we produced a nice paper. Uh, we, we did a lot of calculations, but at the end, we had to prove that it did work. Mm -hmm. So this line uh, called uh, quantum astronomy, because this quantum optics applied to astronomy, does it work or not? So to, to show that it can work, we built two quantum eyes for astronomy. One quantum eye was taken to the telescope in Asiago. The other was taken in Chile and then to the Canaries. Uh, two different telescopes, two different instruments, but with the capability to detect the arrival time of each single photon with an accuracy much better than one nanosecond. I, I wrote here 400 picoseconds. Uh, actually, we can do a little better, but, but the difficulties part is to do it for hours of observations and to, to store the arrival time of each photon in a huge memory. So this was uh, our success, we had to change detector. You cannot use CCDs, charge couple devices, they are too slow, they cannot count every single photon, they are integrating devices after all. You, you integrate in the silicium a number of photons of charges before reading it. So we, we used what they call single photon avalanche photodiodes, which are operated in Geiger mode. This is a bit technical, but uh, for you, who maybe somebody can understand what, what I'm talking about. They are silicon based. They are very efficient in the blue. Uh, they, they can be read uh, out and uh, in a simple way, say simple way, you need a very sophisticated timing uh, system in order to have a real uh, time, a constant time, and a huge memory because uh, if you count every 400 picoseconds, imagine after one hour how many uh, numbers you have to store. But they work, and uh, one, I, I want only to show you one application. As you know, in 1054, the Chinese astrologers detected a very bright star which remained visible for many, many months. 
This star now is the, at the center of a nebula, which the nebula resulted from the explosion of that star. And we know exactly when it exploded, 1054. Uh, and uh, you see the filament, so it means you have magnetic fields all around. And the heart of the thing is the small star inside here, which is the rest of the supernova. It exploded as a supernova. Now it is a neutron star. It's a star composed essentially only by neutrons, extremely compact, say the mass of the sun in 10 kilometers, so a terribly high density, is rotating. And from the rotation, uh, every 33 milliseconds, there is a, it's like a rotating laser where you see every 33 milliseconds a flash. And then there is a, the anti-laser, so you have actually two flashes, a, a large one and a smaller one after 13 milliseconds. And we could study this uh, with our equipment. We, we were the best, um, we, we have the best uh, uh, measurement of this pulsar. For geophysicists, I would like to add that if you measure the arrival time with that precision, and remember that 30 centimeters are one nanosecond, we know the position of the very center of the Earth with a precision of a few millimeters. And so, uh, so we can also <laughs> give some advice to geophysicists where the center of the Earth is. Uh, and, well, okay, one philosophical suggestion. The, the explosion was not seen only in, uh, in China, but also by Indians in New Mexico. They depicted on, uh, on a rock. And, and so, philosophically, you can think the sky as a unifying structure, which can communicate uh, information to civilizations which will never get in contact. And so maybe the same is true also for alien civilization. Uh, okay, let me go to the uh, second and final part of my story. Back to comets, Giotto and Rosetta. Comets have always been a very peculiar thing in the sky attracted a lot of attention because they are a perturbation. They don't fit in any regular description of the sky. So many civilizations were scared by comets, mostly thinking of, say, bad <laughs> events happening, sometimes also good, but mostly bad. And uh, uh, the, well, one simple example, the the beautiful drawing by, by Albrecht Durer, where this, uh, this young alchemist or angel or demon, we don't know, is, is uh, meditating what is this comet about. So you see in the, the many, many things there, but comet is present. So. Uh, Actually, there are different types of comets. Some are very good, some are very um, dull. I, I, I don't want to insist, but there are new comets, there are periodic comets. Some are extremely beautiful, like Elbop over the, the Dolomites here in Italy. The McNaught comet, which was so conspicuous in Chile. Here you see in the red circle the three telescopes of the very large telescope in Chile. So you see very different shapes, but sometimes beautiful, beautiful uh, objects. Uh, Alley, Edmund Alley, uh, was really extremely important for the study of comets because he recognized that uh, four previous comets uh, were actually the same comet reappearing every 75 or 
76 years. He predicted the return, but when the comet returned, he was already died. Uh, the orbit of the comet is very peculiar. It doesn't move around the sun as all the planets in this way, but it moves the other way. Not only, but it's not on the same plane. It's on a plane, as you see, very inclined to, to, the, uh, to the ecliptic plane where the, all the other planets uh, move. And if you look carefully, there is a date there, 2061, which is when the comet will return. So I really wish <laughs> that MCAST can be there to help to study the comet with, uh, with all its facilities in, in uh, all the students. But then if you know the orbit, you can go back in centuries and uh, the Halley Comet was actually, was actually seen in all of these passages, historical passages, since at least year 2040 before Christ. So is uh, is the mother of all comets. In a way, I, I call the comet a cosmic clock because it comes every, say, generation, well, or two generations. <laughs> they didn't live 75 years time ago, but at every time she comes back, she finds a different uh, earth, a different civilization, uh, but she comes, she keeps coming, and so we change and she can spot us and, <laughs> and see how we behave in the meantime. Uh, but uh, two very important uh, events happened in uh, the 15th and 16th century. It was really the start of the scientific study of the comets by Toscanelli in Italy and Appiano in Germany. Their observations were not astrological anymore. They really did very precise measurements of position and so on. So, so this beginning of the scientific era is there. And if you come to Padua, and I really wish you come, in the tower of the observatory, there is a beautiful fresco, which was depicted in around 1750, with the solar system known at the time, which stopped at Saturn, but the orbit of the comet was already depicted there. And when the comet came back, as Ali had predicted, it was a triumph for Newton because the prediction was based on the gravitational law of Newton and the Padovan, uh, Padovan astronomers were able to, cal to calculate the return uh, in 1836. So it's a very nice um, display we have and all the tower is very uh, well worth a visit by you if you, if you wish to come. Uh, and that was the birth of celestial mechanics. I, I don't want to insist on this, but, but the passage of Halley Comet in 1759 really promoted an, an extra extraordinary development of celestial mechanics by great mathematicians, Gauss, Laplace, Lagrange, and, and so on. The next passage, uh, there was another great mathematician, uh, Bessel, but he gave the first hint of physics because uh, he had no photography, so he had to draw, as you see, the aspect of the nucleus. These uh, are his drawings, and he got the impression that the nucleus was very small and behaved like a fountain of matter. So from the nucleus was a fountain of matter, he could not understand the origin of the fountain. And the other thing he discovered is that the orbit of the comet is sometimes perturbed by small perturbations, internal perturbations, what he called non-gravitational forces. And so there were two mechanisms here, the radiation pressure from the sun and 
the uh, melting of the ices of water, and this melting produces a rocket effect uh, uh, in conjunction with the rotation of the comet. Uh, he, uh, Bessel could not understand any of those two properties. It took, it took 50 more years to, to start recognizing uh, that the sun is the real culprit, that the sun is uh, doing both the uh, fountain and the, uh, the fountain and the non-gravitational forces. The next passage of Comet, 1610, finally photography was there. And this picture I show you because it was taken in Catania. And uh, so uh, they, you see the comet. Of course, they use negatives. So the, the bright is, is black and, and the, the stars and the comet are black because they use negatives. Uh, and then they could take spectra. This is, a, uh, below is a, is a modern digital version of the spectrum. And if you see this very bright, very bright uh, line in the violet, this is, was recognized as cyanide, a poisonous gas. The Earth went through the tail of the comet in that particular passage when they recognized the poisonous gas. So there was the sort of thing you see also today. The many people saw that the humanity could die by suffocation. The astronomers did what they could to convince people that it was not true. But you know the journalists and uh, the common, <laughs> the spreading of news among the population. Nobody was convinced. Many committed suicide. Others uh, went into caves. But also there was the funny thing that very, very clever people sold anti-comet pills uh, or sold cans of pure Michelin air. This is what they call it. So, so they made a fortune <laughs> on this thing. Uh, and, uh, and in Germany, there were ladies who had the hope to find the Latin macho in the, in the comet. So you see the, the superstitions are still, are st were still there and I'm afraid are still here today. Comets are, the, the, the tails sometimes are wiggling and uh, the, oh, sorry. And the wiggling action is due by the solar wind, as I told you uh, the, in the lecture of Friday, so I will skip the part. Uh, why do we want to study comets? Because they are pristine bodies. They bring to the Earth lot of materials useful for life, including amino acids. They are laboratories where it is uh, uh, possible to study reactions that otherwise in the laboratory here on Earth you will never study. But why do we want to study them from space? Here is the answer. This is Comet L. Bob, which is a textbook comet with two beautiful tails. Uh, maybe somebody saw the El Bob uh, comet in 1995, 1996, uh, some of you. Okay, so imagine there is the sun here. From the sun, you, uh, there is uh, uh, heat, photons coming out. There are uh, lines of magnetic field. There are particles of the solar wind and uh, this, uh, amount of matter and fields and radiation coming from the sun at a certain point will hit the comet. And so the comet will develop first around this coma, around the nucleus, say 100,000 kilometers of dust and gas. Say 100,000, just to fix an idea, kilometers field, full field of dust and gases. Then 
it develops a tail, a long curved tail, which is composed mostly of dust particles, sometimes of large dimensions. These dust particles move, they spread along the orbit. And so this is why you see it curved. While the ionized matter, ions of uh, many atoms, they, the blue, the blue tail, they are pushed in the antisolar direction. So you see the one tail is curved because it, it, it is affected by gravity, the other not because the gravity is not important for ions, much more important is the solar uh, radiation and the solar wind. So this is why uh, the comet is done like that, but, but all of it, all of it begins inside a very small nucleus, which from the Earth you cannot see. So the only way to understand those difficult physical and chemical processes is to send our spacecraft inside the coma. And this is what we, we did, uh, what Europe did. First with Giotto, a very small spacecraft, it was simply spin stabilized, where no, uh, no, it was not on an inertial platform, but it was spin stabilized, was very fast. It reached the comet uh, very soon with a velocity of about 70 kilometers per second. And you see that if a grain of dust it's you at that velocity, it can really make a big, a big hole. So experimenting with a cannon, uh, maybe even lower velocities is, is very important to select the right material. In our case, we used two, uh, two screens, the first one to break the particle and the second to absorb the projectiles, uh, which did work very well, but uh, why the name Giotto? Because again in Padua, on the Scrovegni Chapel, there is this uh, beautiful painting by Giotto and the um, Magi bringing their, uh, uh, adoring the Jesus and, and there is a comet here on top. And this comet, we, took a photograph in Asiago in the passage of 1866, uh, 1966, and well, there is some similarity. So it is quite possible that the comet painted by Giotto was Halley, because Halley passed a few, few years uh, before the painting. So then, uh, at any rate, the, mis the European mission was named Giotto. There were, as I told you, many other spacecraft, uh, uh, th this scale is a logarithmic scale, so the uh, closest to the nucleus was Giotto, and that was thanks to the uh, Soviet spacecraft, because we didn't know the position of the nucleus. This is the error we, uh, we had on the position of the nucleus. But then the two Vega passed before us, and they reduced the error. So we could perform the last uh, maneuver to go as close as possible to the comet. It was a very, very coordinated exchange of information among the two, the two blocks. This was our camera, the camera we built in Padua. This uh, part here is a baffle for stray light, uh, which of course has to stay out of the a shield, we built uh, a very special metal mirror, this was done in Florence by Officina Galileo, to have an optical surface in stain, stainless steel, but with, with minimum amount of, uh, of weight and great stiffness. And uh, this solution has been now adopted also in uh, armored cars going into the desert because uh, it, we specifically did it to counteract the, uh, 
effect of, uh, of high velocity dust. Uh, this is a Kevlar baffle to suppress the uh, unwanted light. Again, was a very new technique. Uh, we had to use very new paintings and so on. And it was, n I told you, uh, we were on a rotating platform, so taking images was absolutely not easy. We had more electronics on the camera than, than in the entire Giotto mission. We flew the first charge couple devices. We flew in space the first FPGAs. So uh, the Halle multicolor camera was really a, a technological revolution at the time. But we succeeded, and this is the best images we got of the, of the Comet Halle. It's a very dark nucleus, say 16 by 8 by 8. It's dark beca because it's covered by some sort of uh, carbonates. Uh, the sun is here, and you see that from the comet, there are jets of water vapor and dust coming toward the sun. And then the pressure of the sun will push them back in the tail. But at the beginning, the uh, movement is toward the sun. That was the first image of a nucleus. We proved that actually comet have, have a nucleus. But then uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, didn't stop. They wanted to make a much more ambitious uh, mission to a comet. And uh, this mission was named uh, Rosetta. Uh, to a comet with a very differ different orbit. Uh, Halley comes every 75 years. Uh, this comet comes every 6.5 years. Is a say is a um, servant of Jupiter. Is a member of the Jupiter family of comets. Uh, we took an image with the Galileo telescope at the beginning. You see, is nothing like a nice comet. Is is an ugly comet. Is a small one, but is the only one we could we could uh, reach. So we were forced to use this uh, comet as our target. Uh, the name Rosetta, as you know, uh, comes from the stone at the British Museum, but actually it was discovered by the soldiers of Napoleon in the fortress of Rashid El Rashid of Rosetta. 1799, but when the English and Turkish defeated Napoleon, the stone was kept as a, as a, I mean, it was uh, taken by the English and brought to, to London. But uh, at those times, they were also some, they were gentlemen in a way, so the um, G British uh, admiral left uh, the French copy, the scriptures, yeah. The, 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 uh, script, the same phrase is in hieroglyphic, demotic, and Greek. And so a copy was brought to uh, Paris, one to Berlin, and the French, a young French um, archaeologist uh, could start to decipher the uh, hieroglyphs. So the Rosetta Stone was so important for understanding the uh, Egyptian scripture. The name of this uh, young guy was Champollion. In, in England, he was young. Uh, the, the name was young. Uh, the, the, and this is... Uh, when with the Rosetta we flew over Egypt, we took this beautiful image. Uh, you can even see the Nile here. We took this from 5,000 kilometers elevation. Uh, the Rosetta stone is, was in the, uh, near, near the Alessandria and uh, there is now another important element of the space of Rosetta, which is named Agilchia and Philae. 
and uh, they actually come from the lower Nile for much one reason, and they remind us uh, that the obelisk of Philae and uh, the temple actually were discovered and brought to England by Gian Domenico Belzoni, uh, Gian Battista Belzoni, uh, born in Padua, but who spent several years here in Malta before moving to, to Egypt. Okay, so uh, the launch uh, was uh, with an Ariane 5. Everything went very well. Uh, the launch was impeccable. We toured this uh, region of the solar system in between Earth, uh, Mars, and Jupiter. We used uh, three passages around the Earth to get, to get more energy, a gravitational slingshot, as they say, and one passage around Mars to break a bit because we were too fast. So, uh, but it worked very, very well. Uh, in, uh, when we had to move from Mars to Jupiter, uh, everything was switched off, the station was hibernated because we had no power enough to uh, support the instruments. So everything was switched off. And so for two years, we didn't know if Rosetta was alive. But then when she resurrected by an internal command, it was really a big, big relief for everybody. And that was the uh, beginning of August in, uh, uh, 19, in, yeah, in 2014. And this is uh, the huge Rosetta spacecraft. You see the man. This picture was taken in Torino at Alenia, Alenia Space. Uh, we built the two eyes for what we call um, Osiris. You see one of the two large panels, solar panels. There are two NASA instruments but mostly uh, European instruments. And, uh, sorry, and here, this is Philae, the lander. This is the module which actually landed on the comet. This is one of the two solar panels. You see they are huge panels because we need a lot of power. But uh, as I was telling earlier to, to some of your staff, uh, we had rarely we had more than one kilowatt to operate everything, and so uh, instruments could not operate uh, together. We had to share the time. We had to reduce the data rate and this and that. But okay, this is very technical. But actually, it it worked. The lander was supposed to land, uh, and uh, there were. No, number of instruments on the lander, on the spacecraft, and the two communications were through the nucleus to explore the internal of the nucleus. Too bad it didn't work fully, but I'll tell you. Those are the two eyes we built in Padua and in Marseille. Uh, beautiful camera equipped with charge couple devices, 2,000 by 2,000. Very, very good quality very good from the U ultraviolet to the near infrared. This is the camera in the facilities uh, we have in Padua. Uh, before the inspection, before sending it to the spacecraft, uh, we have a clean room in Padua. We have a way of uh, testing, really, the instrument. So, of course, be be welcome if you should need some of our facilities for your instrumentation. Uh, there are two more instrument, Italian instruments on board, one for dust and the other for spectroscopy. So Italy had a very major role in the, in the Rosetta mission. Now, when we opened the eye, the eyes, uh, it was not easy to find the comet. The comet was a point in there, somewhere there. So it took uh, a lot of 
I, young guys from our young fellows to to detect the to detect the comet, which uh, by chance was located near a globular cluster, which is is very very far from it. But so that was uh, the detection. So we knew the comet was there, so the spacecraft could go to the comet very safely. When we arrived around 1,100 kilometers from the comet, we saw a very strange shape, two lobes in the neck. We took a selfie, the spacecraft and the comet. We could see that the comet was rotating 12 hours and already at that time very active with gas production. We could measure very well the density and the dimensions and the mass from the radio science, from the accelerations of the spacecraft you detect, you have the mass, and from the dimensions you have the volume, so you have the density, and, uh, and the density is less than the density, uh, half the density of the water, so if, you, if the comet <laughs> was on the sea, you <laughs> it was stay there, uh, you see the dimension, a few kilometers uh, across. We gave uh, Egyptian names to the several uh, structures of the comets. The geologists identified different geological structures and we named them after important uh, Egyptian uh, deities or uh, important personas. We saw fantastic panorama. I guess it's, uh, we, nobody really think of a comet like that, but uh, uh, this is w w what it is. Uh, sometimes you, you can make a parallel with, uh, with our dolomites. This is the comet and the, those are the dolomites, but of course, the gravity is very different, the density is different, but still, superficially, the similarity is impressive. We, we found the Giza pyramids. We, we saw uh, this is Giza, and those are boulders in the comet, and we named um, Cheops. Uh, you, you see, the, the bed here is exactly the same. It's, uh, is, is dust where you have uh, superimposed a boulder of 50 meters, which is composed by other smaller subunits, but they are all pieces of ice. And uh, we could also see very strange phenomena, like, uh, like uh, boulders moving and uh, dunes in the regolith. And this is due to the gases, the outgasses, outgassing uh, co continuously from the, from the rocks and they move also the sand. There is no wind up there, of course. We could see a big fracture, but uh, so we, we thought maybe the comet will break, but it didn't. We could see a pit, or actually many pits, and those pits are so nice. I mean, they are so round. <laughs> you can think of somebody who did it. But uh, for us, the important thing is, is you can look inside. So you can uh, say the different, the different strata uh, up to, say, 100 meter below the surface. Uh, we attempted then to land. This is important to land file right on that spot. Uh, we, we chose that spot because scientifically it was the best spot we could uh, land. And this is uh, how they did. The spacecraft came up, made a sudden turn, and then at a certain point released file to the comet, and then he went away. Actually, it was a very slow thing. It took seven hours to cross this space. And this is a simulation of how 
it was done. You see, we selected the small lobe. We wanted to exactly to that target, and we did within 50 meters. It was a fantastic shot. So you see the comet and the filet going to it. We could, from our uh, Osiris eyes on the Rosetta, we could detect uh, the steps of the um, of file on in front of the comet, but all of the sudden there was the disaster. We could see, maybe you can see, the three holes here imprinted by the three legs of file, but then unfortunately file rebounced. And we were lucky enough that it didn't rebound to space. But it, we, we could see her flying below the horizon. We were very lucky. We, we took this image with the three imprints, and then we took the file. You, you see, with, you can still see the three legs flying below the horizon, and finally, she made a big flight of several kilometers and went to uh, land in, in, in a dark spot. So uh, this was uh, a real d disaster because uh, instead of sticking there for some uh, error in, in the, um, there were their pools who were supposed to to, to be uh, inserted in the ground, but the gun was too hard. And then it, they rebounced, and so, okay. So uh, we didn't have all the science meant, but still, Phile managed to do something because the battery, before the battery went off. Another disaster happened a few months later. We were say at 20 kilometers over the comet, uh, navigating there very, very well. With, as you see, we, we had spectacular images. We could really detect all details of, of that comet. But then at a certain point, the comet became too active. Too many dust grains were flowing out of the surface. They were not a danger for impact because the velocity was very small, say less than one kilometer per second. The danger came from the grains being mistaken by stars, by the star trackers, because there were bright speckles in the sky, like this one, and so the spacecraft started to follow the grains and not the dust. So there was a real danger to lose the spacecraft, a real danger. So the, uh, the spacecraft in, uh, automatically put him, is himself in what we call a safe mode. Everything is off and then rush away. It went to 400 kilometers in very quickly away from the comet. And, uh, and uh, we scientists, asked his, uh, let's go back. And he say, no, you're crazy. <laughs> and we said, no, please, let's go back. And he, and he, and he started saying, no, no, and no, and no. And so it was several months before we were allowed to go back. So we lost some high resolution. We got beautiful data and beautiful images anyhow, like, uh, like this one. We, we saw jets. We saw boulders here flowing away, but we were at a distance. And uh, although we insisted with his uh, engineers always win, and so this is another message for you engineers. Uh, th those were two beautiful displays of the comet near the perihelium, which happened in August 2015. You see the bright, uh, the bright display there, and 
and uh, the huge fan uh, of gas a few days later. So the comet did, did really its job. At the end of the year, so we were supposed to, to stop operation, but ESA decided that we deserved some in compensation for what we had lost. We, decide, uh, we, we de deserved, say, uh, nine months more. So they gave us nine months of additional life, and everything worked. I mean, our, uh, the equipment was not I was not tested for such a longer mission, but still everything worked very, very well. At the time, we were already beyond Mars and going again toward Jupiter, so very far from the sun. We took in Asiago our last picture in January 2016. The comet had, had the tail of several thousand, hundred thousand kilometers. The same day, from Osiris inside here, so 30 kilometers. So we can combine the tail and the coma with the nucleus. Uh, in March, the comet was still a bit active, and this is a big mystery. We still don't understand the source of the energy which produced those small flashes. And finally, uh, we come to September, end of the mission. This is the last image we could transmit. Uh, very small pieces of, uh, of dirt and uh, ISIS. And uh, then we, Rosetta was also sent to rest uh, on this uh, part where Fire went before, uh, before her. Conclusion, sorry. Conclusion. The comet will come back, as I told you, in 2061. There is real time to prepare for another mission, a better mission than Rosetta, but uh, it's never too soon. So if you have some interest in uh, uh, in instruments for cometary applications, the cannon or detectors or structural uh, studies for new materials, be ready. Okay, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. It was uh, an amazing um, overview of uh, the projects uh, you took part in. Thank you so much for uh, sharing with us. And uh, I'm pretty sure it was uh, inspiring for all of you. Who is uh, um, pretty young uh, will understand in the years of importance uh, we will understand better the importance of what we are uh, uh, seeing now. And uh, as I was uh, mentioning at the beginning, this is a great example, an inspiration, uh, and uh, a, a very strong uh, push to go further and um, to um, deepen our, our knowledge. So thank you very much uh, once again. And uh, I don't know if there are uh, questions, curiosities. Steven? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Barbieri. Very interesting for me, this presentation. I have a question about the slide you showed about the pulsar, which, which is radiating every 33 milliseconds. And I was wondering maybe if such a high energy system as a pulsar, if there are maybe plans to have observatories in space to analyze the gamma part of the spectrum and the X-ray part, because I would assume it is radiating a lot of gamma rays also, such as such a, such a, such a pulsar. What, what, what would you say about that? Is there, are there plans or are there any oh, such yeah. observatories? Yeah, the, the, this pulsar 
particular person in the club, Nebula, is uh, one of the very few which you can observe in optical uh, regions. Most of them are only radio or only X-rays. But this particular one can be observed in all spectral regions, all electromagnetic regions. So you have the gamma rays, the X-rays, the UV, the, uh, the optical, infrared, and radio. So uh, this pulsar is observed uh, very, very well, continuously. The other added virtue is you can observe it both from south and from north. So we can observe it from Asiago, but also from Chile. And so it's extremely well covered. We, I saw you only a very simple light curve. But as you, as you say, the energy of this pulsar is enormous. And this uh, enormous pouring out of energy through, say, mechanism like synchrotron radiation uh, and uh, with a magnetic field which breaks the pulsar, actually reduces the um, every, every, I mean, we can detect not only the, peri the period but also is first derivative and second derivative, the pulsar is slowing down because the energy uh, is decreasing. So f since uh, uh, more than 20 years now, we know very well how the energy decreases, the periods get longer and longer, and sometimes this pulsar, and this we don't really understand, as a glitches, it's not terribly regular. And so uh, it's a very complex, it's a very complex system. It's one neutron star, but full of surprises. We could, uh, with our instrument actually, we made a discovery that uh, when the, um, when the uh, radio pulses get brighter, we will sometimes, the radio, uh, pulses gets much brighter. Also the optical uh, get not extremely, but appreciably brighter. So there is some interaction between the radio and the optical, although the emissions are from very different regions of the uh, area of the volume surrounding the pulsar. So the car pulsars is, is, is a fantastic laboratory. And, uh, and so we, I mean, that's very technical, but knowing the first derivative uh, of, of a time function and knowing the second derivative, then you get accelerations and um, energy production mechanisms and so on. So, so we, keep, we keep observing it very regularly everywhere. Professor Barbieri, you have taken me to two <laughs> beautiful journeys in this one hour one yes. to, to our University of Padova and the fascinating uh, sciences that take place there. But the most interesting uh, journey you've taken me beyond Earth, where you have taken me to this comet here. Yeah. And my question to you, to these young people here, if they were to embark on such research, on such uh, a fascinating science of astronomy, what, what lesson have you learned out of your long experience that is so relevant today for these young people to embark on such a study and why would it be interesting for them to embark on such studies and um, what, how can we improve humanity, if I may say so, which, with, with, with such studies and such sciences? Um, well, that's a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> but uh, uh, let me point out that if you do science, uh, a big science, maybe astronomy, maybe uh, nuclear physics, particle physics, biology, Etc. Now, you cannot do it except in 
large international institutions. And this is the first lesson they have to learn, that you have to be prepared not only to move, which is easy, but also to interact with people of very different mentalities, cultures, attitudes, and that their relationships are not always pleasant. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> taking Italian and German, it, it, not necessarily it works, I mean, but okay, I'm, I'm a bit joking. But uh, uh, in our, say in Rosetta, was a thousand people from, uh, say, material sciences, from uh, uh, telecommunications, uh, from optical field, uh, scientific field. So it, it was a, a huge effort, coordinated, and uh, it must be very well coordinated. We changed manager a couple of times because managers are sometimes not up to the point. And so uh, this is a lesson. Be open to interaction with other people and uh, express yourself, listen, but also don't, don't abandon your ideas if they are good. The second lesson I learned my, the hard way, we had many failures. I had many failures during my life. Take, for instance, the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope uh, was delayed by several years because of problems in, the, in uh, some part. And the launch is always the critical, the most critical part because is it three minutes if the rocket fails, you are done forever. Uh, but uh, when it was finally launched and we opened the eye of uh, the Hubble, we European had the best detector on board. We made a very special detector that was why we were given 15% of the observing time. We gained the 15% uh, because we provided a fantastic instrument. And then when we opened the eye, it didn't work. Not our instrument. There was a severe optical defect in the Hubble. They didn't discover what we call a spherical aberration of the mirror. Think of a project which is, <laughs> say, one billion dollar, and, this, and, and, uh, and there is an optical defect which they should have discovered, but they didn't. Okay, then that was a big disappointment. To fix it, the, there was the need to build a, a corrector which was taken up by the astronauts in another flight. Uh, and this corrector could be installed only because the shuttle could go high as high. But when the shuttle was gone, there was no other rocket. I mean, if today there is a f another failure, there's no way to go there. Then, always have a space telescope. We said, okay, go to that star, and, and the software went to the other. <laughs> so this is for mathematicians. In the pointing algorithm, there are thousands of matrices to be rotated. And somebody made a mistake of one sign. Instead of a plus, he put a minus somewhere. So again, another 50 million software developed by, by I don't tell you who, had this failure. We commanded the telescope to, and it went the other way. So that's what really was fixed and this and that, but it was all a loss of, a loss of uh, valuable observing time. Uh, now the James Webb Space Telescope, so the successor, should have been launched in 2014. And it's still there on the ground. Maybe it will be launched. Another thing which I, if I, if I may, if I'm not, uh, because it just to do with Brexit. 
<laughs> in a way. Uh, when, uh, um, when the Americans in 2004 launched two missions to Mars, both missions failed. And uh, one failure was because in a very complex software, somebody changed units from metric to, uh, say, inches to centimeters without, uh, without recognizing it. So uh, it <laughs> although they had a fantastic software to check the software, that error went unnoticed. So that, that was the case of the fail. The other one was that the accelerator was mounted, this is for your mechanics, was mounted right to there. So, so it didn't understand that it was touching the soil because the accelerometer didn't give any answer, and so it crashed. Oh, so, so it crashed. So you see, there are many, many ways to be disappointed. You have to endure those because, uh, after all, if it is your responsibility, you have to stand in front of, of, the, of the people and say, okay, we, are, we repair. So I, I had myself many failures. And this is uh, a way that you discover you have internal resources you will never think you have. I mean, so uh, doing hard things is an hard lesson. And uh, mm, uh, sorry, I don't want to be a philosopher but, or a psychologist, but really you learn how to, to overcome difficult situations if, if you are strong enough and if you trust yourself. Any questions? No young people? Young so, you, so you can, since, since I'm sitting in between two engineers here, <laughs> it was very depressing to hear that engineers always win. <laughs> so sometimes they don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always. <laughs> okay. They normally always win, so, so, so you are a lucky your man. theory is correct. So if you, if you can win, good for you. <laughs> I never did. <laughs> okay, so if there aren't uh, other questions, or uh, if uh, you would like to do a final remark, we can... Uh, oh no, final remark is thank you. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Now you can enjoy the buffet. Professor uh, is here if you would like uh, to ask uh, not in public uh, questions and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>